Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to introduce to all of you Ginestra Bianconi. That, uh, she will be visiting, visiting us actually for two weeks. And it's a wonderful opportunity for us to learn many of the great things that she's been doing. Ginestra she is a professor of applied mathematics at, at Queen's Mary in London. And she has had a very useless career in the field of uh, statistical mechanics and the interface with mathematical physics, in particular in the context of network. And for, for instance, she has been the one proposing models for network, for condensation in network, uh, Basil the Cohen model, and many other great ideas. And she has also written two books, which is actually very remarkable. One of them is about the topics that uh, will be the core of these lectures, at least at the beginning. And uh, let me just mention that the idea of this lecture is to have them very interactive. So please ask questions to Ginestra. Part of it will be at the, at the, with slides, part of it will be on Blackboard. So the, the goal is really to learn as much as possible as long as she is around. And with that, without any further ado, Ginestra, please. Thank you so much uh, for the introduction, um, for the invitation, Marcello. It's a pleasure to be here. I've been here in ICTP several years as a postdoc, so I have a strong connection to the place and the French. I want to like uh, to, speak, to tell you about the recent re research we have been doing in uh, higher order network. And this is a research that is connecting network geometry and topology with uh, uh, dynamics. And it was first started as a research line related to brain research. And soon after, we realized that this has much more broader application, also ranging to theoretical physics and machine learning. So this, uh, I would like to start this lesson, though, with a citation. And this citation comes from a very famous mathematician working in uh, brain uh, vision. And he says, the world is continuous, but the brain is discrete. And of course, if you believe in this sentence, of course, you think that uh, network will be very important to understand the brain, which is, of course, a very important scientific task, but there will be little space for discrete uh, argument in the world. And another point of view is instead the point of view of uh, Roger Perros, which goes to the um, extreme uh, uh, opposite uh, view. And he says, in my own view, is that ultimately physical law should find their most natural expression in terms of essentially combinatorial principle. Tools in accordance to such a view should emerge some form of discrete and combinatorial space-time. So these are sentences uh, which have been written at the middle of the last century. And from, from there to now, we have a big progress in, in networks. Um, networks are a set of nodes and edges. And they describe a large variety of complex systems. Of course, the brain, as we mentioned, but also many other complex systems. And they are becoming a common language for, for complexity. But recently, it has become clear that actually this is only a partial view of an interacting system, a graph with node and interaction, because actually interaction can be higher order. So you might not have all, all yet two elements interacting together, but also three or more elements. And these are included in higher order network, uh, which are built by node, edges, triangle, tetrahedra, and so on. And um, so, uh, for instance, these are an example of simplicial complex that are formed by node, triangle, tetrahedra, and so on. And this has a broad application. For instance, intuitively, you can think of a collaboration network. So, uh, you know, you have in your own experience that when you write paper, it's not only single author or two author, but sometimes it's more than two author, and then this will be a, a, a field triangle um, among the three author of, of the collaboration network. Of, of the paper. And I know the network are also raising a lot of interest in brain research. Um, because, uh, you know, intuitively you can think that you can have three regions of the brain that are activated uh, pairwise, so you have three pairwise correlation, but you might also have 
higher order correlation, for instance, three regions of the brain activated at the same time. And then you want to distinguish between these two cases and have uh, one representation as an unfilled triangle, just two node and three edges, three pairwise interaction, or you might have also a three-way interaction, um, capturing this many-body interaction in the system. And actually, this synthesis allow also topological and geometrical interpretation, and there is a lot of interest in the brain to characterize the algebraic topology of brain dynamics, and people are speaking about Betty number in the brain. Of course, this is still uh, research ongoing, but there is a quite of a consensus that actually applied topology and persistent homology are, are very important to, to characterize higher order network in the brain. And of course, simplicial complexes before their their role in higher order network have been used in a lot of application in, in, in quantum gravity because of course also if you don't believe that space-time is intrinsically discrete then you might want to use simplicial complex to discretize and solve problems such as renormalization uh, of gravity. So many approaches also if they don't believe that intrinsically space-time is discrete then they need to use simplicial complex in any case to define um, their quantity. So going back to, to complexity, I mean, there is this uh, general theme that uh, comes from biology, comes from, as a long story in physics, to understand the interplay between structure and dynamics. Okay. So, for instance, the structure of the protein and the function of the protein. This is a general question in biology. And in network, this question uh, has been uh, tackled from the beginning of the field in which people have, been, have thought about the interaction between the structure of the network and its dynamics. And typically, the structure has been always considered uh, um, evaluated with statistical and combinatorial quantity. For instance, the degree distribution, so how many, the distribution of how many no link a node has. And one knows that when this distribution is broad, so for instance, in the network, there are many important, significant up node, you know, like in the internet, like in the airport network, where you have an important airport. Um, uh, then the phase diagram of dynamical process changes. And so you have changes in the easy model, changes in the collation, and we have known, we have learned to know that this is very important also for epidemic spreading. And this is one of the most important uh, results in natural theory, that actually if you have this broad degree distribution, then uh, spreading of epidemics become very, um, very likely. And you don't have, for any small infectivity, you have the pandemic. But actually, this is only part of the story, because when you look at higher order network, actually, simplicial topology and simplicial geometry play an important role in shaping the interplay between structure and dynamics. And so this, this series of lectures is to develop this understanding of how can we have a much broader understanding of the interplay between structure and dynamic, including topology and geometry. And some initial <laughs> direction, uh, what I highlighted in my, in my book is a small introduction in book on simplicial complex, but I, I, I think that probably this uh, lecture will give a much broader understanding of the field and, and theoretical basis for this. So, what do we mean when we speak about topology? Topology is the study of shape and their invariant. So the invariant, uh, you know, when you have a deformation of, of, of the shape, and uh, some important invariant are the Betty numbers. So the Betty zero is the number of connected components in a graph. So the number of, uh, so if you have a connected network, the Betty zero is one. So a, a point has a Betty zero equal to one, a circle equal to one, and a torus equal to one. If you would have a torus plus a point, you would have Betty one equal to two, right? 
Betty, Betty Zero equal to two, sorry, here I'm speaking only of Betty Zero. But Betty One is said is that one dimensional holes, like you have in the circle, and the Betty Two is the number of two dimensional holes, like you have in a sphere. Okay? And these topological invariants are, are very important and uh, they can be used to uh, characterize uh, data sets, also network data sets. And there is a whole field that is persistent homology that is used to characterize the structure of a network or a point cloud using topology. But here my, my focus is to use topology to study dynamics. And from this point of view, it emerged something, so a point of view which is completely different uh, respect to what has been told until now. Um, so network dynamics until now has been only studied almost exclusively with the dynamics assigned to the node. So for instance, in epidemic spreading, a node can be factored of node. In an easy model, you put a spin on each node. But actually, we can assign a dynamical variable to each simplex. So to each node, to each address, and to each triangle, we can in general assign a dynamical variable. And these are called topological signals. So that actually the dynamical variable of the network is encoded in what we call a topological spinner, which has three blocks, the node, the edge, and the triangle. So a function defined on each node, each edge, and each triangle. So I just want to want to, that I will use the blackboard afterward, but I just want to give you the intuition now so that you know, you know where we are going and what is the aim of these lessons. So when you have this global picture of the dynamic of the network, actually you want uh, to see if, if there are data about these topological signals, and actually in, in, while topological signal is somewhat uh, used in, uh, in uh, in uh, theoretical physics, you know, gauge fields are associated typically to the edge, or, but in, in complexity, this is a completely new point, point of view. And actually, the question is that if you have topolo if, if this topological signal exists, if, if, to, if you have them in, in reality, so you can think any flux among two nodes can be considered as an edge signal, so any current, okay? So, for instance, a synaptic connection between two neurons, or uh, there is an important neuroscientist, Olaf Spors, which also proposed a way to characterize H, H signal between two regions of the brain, so macroscopically, not between two neurons. And, um, you, and, and also you might have a variable on the triangle. For instance, the citation that a group of three people got, and you track this over time, this can be a, a variable associated to, to the triangle. And another set of variables are, are vector field. So if you define the speed of wind at given location on the surface of the Earth, and you have a triangulation of the surface of the Earth, so you, you have this vector there in each point, and then what you can do is you, you can project this vector on the triangular tessellation of the Earth and consider that projection along the different edges, and then you can treat it as Cauchy. Um, so, the question is, if, if there are these topological signals, can we learn the dynamics for the complex system, topology, and geometry? Or if you want to change complex system to you know, any, any interacting system you want to describe? And another question is, can we learn the topology and the geometry from the dynamics, from this higher order of dynamics? This is the research question that uh, uh, we ask. And in order to ask this question, we need to uh, understand a bit the terminology coming from algebraic topology. And this, the, the global challenge 
is to have a theory which includes natural geometry, natural topology, and this topological spinner, this description of the dynamics on top of the simplicial complex, eventually interpret all this with the tool of information theory in order to get a better understanding of physical system. And by physical system, what I have in mind are on one side the brain, nonlinear dynamics, on one side theoretical physics, why not, we can try, and AI, okay? AI algorithm. Um, so an example of the thing we will discuss in this course are, for example, what happens to nonlinear dynamics uh, the Kuramoto model that has been studied a lot when, when the variables are associated to the node, what happens if you associate them to the edges, right? And to give you an, a light of this uh, result, is the fact is that why if the variables are associated to the node, you have only one fundamental state. When the functions are associated to the edge, you have many fundamental states, and actually, these minima are localized on the holes. So as an example of visualization of the dynamics you can get, something like this, that is, 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 this is at the fundamental state, so uh, the, but you see there are two minima, one associated to one hole and one associated to the other hole. And, and the goal of this lesson is to tell you about this and to give you all the background necessary so maybe you need a little bit of patience at the beginning there's a lot of math a lot of mathematics i hope will be easy understandable but you need to carry on and and then we will understand this new collective phenomena and if you fill for instance one of these hole and the other you keep it empty you have ways to distinguish between which all are empty and which all are, are full. And if you fill all loops, the dynamics freeze. Okay? So only if you have petty number one, you can have a non trivial dynamics on the edge. And then you can consider also uh, an operator which is very interesting that couple dynamical topological signals of different dimensions. So if you have signal on the node and a signal on the edge and you want to couple them, how should you use, what should you do? And the operator uh, that is really indicated to do this is the Dirac operator, so we will define that. And this Dirac operator has application in complexity, but as well, you know, uh, you can, um, Translate in the discrete world um, some of the results of theoretical physics. For instance, in the Nambu Yonalazino approach, you, uh, you, you, you have a, 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 a Dirac, massless Dirac field theory uh, which, with a nonlinear interaction, which acquire mass thanks to the nonlinear interaction. So when you have this Dirac massless field theory, you can write it in terms of this Dirac operator, and then you, 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 you perform the calculation of the number you know, in the model, and you find the mass. And so we will maybe discuss later uh, how this mass uh, comes about. And this mass actually depends on the Betty number. And in particular, uh, one and on the, on, also on the geometry of, of, the, of, of the network. So just to mention some of the highlights I would like to touch during this four lesson. And another uh, approach is trying to have a information theory which uh, couple matter fields described by, by topological spinner and geometry, so metric degree of freedom. And the idea is that you might have a metric with actually um, is, uh, is influenced by the metric induced by the matter field. And so you can take as an action the quantum relative entropy between the metric and the metric induced by the matter field. And interesting, this action with the proper choice of the uh, 
metric in use by the MAPA field will give you for free the, um, the equation for, for the matter. So the Ken Goddard equation and also the Dirac equation. But this is, uh, so the outline of the course is this one. So um, first of all, today I would like to cover introduction to algebraic topology. This is very important. So what is a chain? What is a cochain? What are boundary operator and co-boundary operator? And these, they are useful to characterize practically discrete divergence, discrete gradient, and discrete curl on any simply shell complex, for instance. In lesson two, we will describe Ochi Laplacian, which then describe diffusion from n synthesis to n synthesis, and the Dirac operator as well, which is the square root of the Laplacian. And then in lesson three, so this will be, you know, with, with the Dirac operator, we, we, got, we get into some more research like your question, but it would be more textbook result in algebraic topology. In lesson three, uh, I will tell you a, a little bit about weighted cohomology, so introducing a metric, and then when you introduce within a metric, you can define this quantum entropy, uh, and I will discuss this late um, paper, and maybe also about the, the mass of the, uh, of the network. And in lesson four, I will give um, an overview of nonlinear dynamics for brain research, let's say. And in the seminar, I will speak more, more widely about uh, several other results that we will be good. So this lesson is essentially like this. So we have an introduction to algebraic topology. So we already mentioned uh, topological signals so of chain and cochain and boundary and co-boundary operator. So the take-home message, if you don't understand anything on the board, the take-home message is that we have this picture of the dynamics of the simplicial complex in which the dynamics is, is associated to each node, each edge and each triangle or each uh, higher order simplex, you have an higher order simplex. So, if you are just node, edge, and triangle, you have this uh, vector. So uh, associated to the key is associated to the node, C is associated to each edge, and key is associated to each triangle. And then with this variable, you can associate a gradient. So to a function defined on each node, you associate the gradient or co-boundary operator. Uh, yeah, I think that, that should be delta zero, sorry, instead of delta one. So, um, so the, the co-boundary operator practically does the gradient and associated to the edge. So it goes from a function on the node to a function on the edge and gives the difference between the function and the two end point. Then you have the adjunct of that, it's always a zero there, not the one. So the adjunct is the divergence. So you have a function defined on the edges, you do gradient in minus gradient out, and you put it on the node. That's the, the, the gradient. And then if you want a function, if you have again a function defined on the edges, but then you have also triangle, you can do the curve. So when you do the curve, then you will do a circuitation around the triangle. I see people are taking notes, so I just uh, wait a bit. Yeah, so, uh, so you can do the curve. So uh, again, yes, yeah, so just put the one plus one, with delta one. Uh, uh, so you do, you do the, you have a triangle. This is field triangle, but I didn't mention, this, this didn't indicate that it's field. And you have the function defined on the edge. And then you associate it to the triangle, the circuitation around. So that's the take home message. Hopefully, in the remaining hour, we, I will explain this. And, and probably there is also this other thing, so that these are linear, uh, operation, 
right? linear transformation. So they are encoded in matrices. These are rectangular matrices and are called boundary operator, which encode, uh, for instance, the diversions, the gradient, and the color. And uh, the boundary B1 is defined between node and has node in the row and edge in the column, and the B2 has edge in the row and triangle in the column. And with this, uh, with this boundary operator, we can do, I mean, this is the beauty of algebraic topology. Practically, you reduce topology, which seems like quite this esoteric thing, you know, to look the number and things like that. You reduce all this to linear algebra. And then the only difficulty is to handle rectangular matrices. So in the field of network, people that usually always use adjacency matrices, which, you know, the adjacency of node. Uh, these are square matrices, but actually all the higher order topology of a simplicial complex can be encoded by a set of rectangular matrices. Okay, so this simplifies, so for the moment we will not use tensor or anything like that, we will only use this rectangular matrix. So of course, you can multiply in such a way that it becomes square. That's, that, that's the only thing for, for today that I want to tell you. Uh, and then tomorrow we will go uh, a bit further. Sorry, maybe a dumb question. Um, so this description where you have um, you know, the different simplices, there's redundant information in that, right? Um, is that? Redundant information in the sense that it's sort of like an overcomplete description. Yeah. So uh, yeah, we, we will. So in a simplicial complex, there is a big debate. I want to skip a little bit about this, but uh, we can we can go and we can discuss further. Actually, be a good result for that. So when you have data, you might have data that is in the form of a hypergraph, not of a simplicial complex. And the difference between either graph and simplicial complex, which I will mention uh, later on, is that actually uh, in a simplicial complex, simplicial complex is a set of synthesis, which has the additional condition that is closed under the inclusion of the phases of each simplex. And this means that if you have a triangle, then you need to have all the edges and all the nodes of the triangle itself. So this leads probably to your question that is redundant. Um, instead, if you have an either graph, you only have you might only have a triangle without I see, okay. uh, just um, and and somehow people and computer scientists always push with with either graph um, because they say that simplicial complex when you reduce your data set to simplicial complex you you lose some information because practically you need to include these edges also. If, for instance, two, paper, two people have not a paper together or something like that. But um, this is actually only a partially partial true because if you have weighted simplicial complexes, you can encode in the weight the information about the hypergraph. So you can have a linear transformation between the hypergraph and the simplicial complex that is um, taking advantage of the weight. So actually, simplicial complex might also be useful to weighted simplicial complex might be also be used to represent hypergraph data. Okay, thank you. We have a paper on that with Bacini et al. Are there other questions? Or? Just a silly one. So these are boundary operations, fine, the versions getting curved, and the co-boundary, can you repeat again the difference? The, the co-boundary, uh, yeah. So, if, if you have a, if you have, a, so the co-boundary uh, is the fine, is the fine over co-chain, right? So function defined on node edges and triangle, um, and and uh, the co-boundary uh, between this function between. Um, Function on the edge and another function on the edge, you can add a scalar product. Okay? If this scalar product is the edge to norm, 
the co-boundary matrices are the transpose of the boundary matrices. And we will deal this. Uh, today we will also discuss cohomology to show that they are the transpose of, of the boundary matrix. So practically it's the same if you call it boundary or co-boundary, just uh, you need to put a, a transpose to, to the other. But uh, of course, if you have uh, weighted cohomology, so if you have a metric matrices, this is different. So. Are there other questions? OK, so let me stop sharing. Yes. Ah, OK, OK, like, you know, yeah. Sorry? You have vectors and covectors, and if you have that space time, then you just use the metric. Yeah. But it's trivial. But if the metric is not trivial, then the covector is vector. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. B0, B1, B2, B. Uh, okay, sorry. BD. BD. D or M. So you have, for instance, a node is a zero simplex, an edge is a one simplex and a triangle, this triangle is a two simplex. Okay. So what are simple sharp complexes? And here we go back to, to the question before. Simple sharp complexes are a set of simplices with additional conditions that are closed under the inclusion of the faces. So, complexes simplicial complex K is a set of simplices close. Under the inclusion <coughs> of the faces of each simplex. What are the faces of each simplex? The face of each simplex are simplices that are constructed by a proper subset of the node. So, for instance, if you have this simplicial complex here, so this is one, two, three, and four, the simplicial complex will include the triangle, And we'll include the two four edges. But then I need to include all the faces of the triangle and all the faces of this edge. So I need to include one, two, two, three, and one, three. I 
need to include one, two, three. These are the faces of the triangle and the faces of the other edge is two, which I already have. So, these simplices that are not the face of any other simplices, the simplices in red, these are called facets. So, uh, the dimension of a simplicial complex, yeah? In the definition of simplex, I'm not sure what is the is it always like uh, the two simplex, for example? What's the difference between that and something that doesn't include the middle part, for example? So the triangle without, not field triangle. Yeah. Okay, so if you have, you tell me, you know, you have this and you have this, okay? So in this construction, what I would have, I would have the triangle, right? And all the faces, okay? So we are already we are done already this, but let me just do it again. So one, two, two, three, one, three, one, two, and three. So which is the facet of this simplicial complex? This one to three, because it's the uh, phases, the, the simplices that is not phases of any other simplex. And if I have this with this empty, right? How would I do? Just the edges. Yeah. The faces are the edges. Okay, so the, the, the facet are the edges. So I will have one, two, two, three and one, three, and then I need to include their faces, so I need to include their node. One, two, three. Okay? So what is the dimension of the simplicial complex? The dimension, the dimension of, of a simplex is, 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 is D, also M. <laughs> uh, and the dimension of the simplicial complex is the largest dimension of any of these synthesis. Okay? <coughs> so here the dimension of this simplicial complex is two. This is dimension k is equal to two, and here dimension of k is equal to one. Okay? And also you have distinction between simplicial complex that are pure and not pure. Simplicial complex that are pure, so these are all examples of simplicial complex that are pure, have all the facet of the same dimension. Okay? Here the facet is a triangle, so only one dimension two. Here the facet are only the edges, they are all the same dimension, this is pure. So this would be pure, this is pure, what about this? The facet one is dimension two and the other is dimension one, this is not pure. Before we go to, um, to algebraic topology, really, because I, I mean, for me, this was quite important to realize because I, I was learning this thing while, uh, while working on this topic is what is the equivalent of a manifold in the discrete world, right? Because not every simplicial complex is a manifold. So, some of the research questions <coughs> might actually be. Be mal posed 
for instance, the curvature of the superficial copper. There is a lot of research on the com 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 mm. co uh, curvature of the superficial copper. But actually, the only one that will have the right continuum or the right or a continuum limit that is a one of differential geometry will be the curvature of a discrete manifold because the curvature of another general simplicial complex that is not a manifold will not have a continuum limit in, in the thermal differential geometry, right? So I think for me it was quite important to point down what makes something a manifold. So yeah, um, maybe the easier way to present this is by showing an example, okay? So something, this is a manifold, and this is not a manifold. So, Let's start with not a manifold. So, also if I, the manifold should be pure, but also if I have a pure simplicial complex, if I have something, I use another color because yeah, just, it, it's not anything special. I have another sim simplex here, right? like a fig, something that branches. This is not a manifold, okay? Because I have this fin, okay? It has good property if you remove the fin because it's called it is M connected. So if you go uh, M minus uh, M, so let me just uh, M, okay. So if you have just this instead, this is a manifold. Simplicial complex is a manifold, and here I state few characteristic. It should be d minus one connected. That means that if I'm on this simplex, I can go to other d simplices by path that cross d minus one simplices. So here I am in a two-dimensional simplex, I cross an edge and I go to another two-dimensional simplex and then I go to the other two-dimensional edges, okay? So if I have something, for instance, I put it here, not a manifold again, I add here this thing. This is not one connected <coughs> because I need to go through the node to go to the other triangle. So it should be d minus one connected, and uh, it should have an additional property that avoid pinches. So something like uh, I don't know if I can. Uh, can draw this picture. Can I ask something on the connection? Okay. Uh, let, me, let me just show, show you with, with a piece of paper. So you need to avoid the, the fact that you have manifold that falls and pinches. Okay? So what you need to do is you, if you have for every alpha and alpha prime that are D simplex of K, either alpha intersection alpha prime belongs to K or alpha intersection alpha prime 
is zero. So it cannot be a point. Uh, no, so there are edges, they cannot be. Sorry, that belongs to K and should be D, D, D minus one of edge. So you need to avoid pinches. And another thing you need to do is you have to do, and this is realized here, you need to have every D simplices, uh, sorry, every D minus one simplex, so for instance any edge there, incident at most to two triangle. Okay? So any 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 D simplex. is incident to at most two D simplices. Okay? So here you have every edge is either incident to one triangle or to two triangle. If you have a volume, right? You have a tetraedra and another tetraedra, you want every triangle incident at most to two tetraedra to have something that is a manifold, which is a volume. Okay? If you have, for instance, this edge here is incident to one, two, and three triangles, so that's not good. Okay? So, Ginesta, I have a naive question. Why that, doesn't the second property imply the first one? Because if I have a the second, if the second property holds, it's automatically d minus one connected, no? Um, no, connectivity means that every d simplex can be reached by any other d simplex along a path going to d minus one simplex. So, if you have a triangulation of this, this would be one connected. One. But if you pinch it, it will still be one connected. But in addition, you have the pinch. Ah, okay. So that blue triangle there is a, is a very specific way of pinching that will also make it... Yeah, it, it, this, the blue is this. Yes, yes. Yeah. I will keep D minus one connectivity. But uh, if I have the blue triangle and one of the other the triangles blue. on the plane, they will share only... The blue triangle will no, right, satisfy right. one and two. You're right, you're right. Yeah, in general, it would. Yeah, I see, I see. So I, I still visually don't see, like on the right figure, the not manifold figure, mm -hmm. where exactly is the second condition violated if there is any of it? Because the first. No, this answer... is not. The second condition is not yet violated. Okay. Yeah. If you want, you. You need to practically identify, if you want to be related, you might identify, I don't know, and you identify, I don't know, this with this. Okay, I see. Okay, so. Should we stop here and do all the algebraic topology in the next hour? I don't know, is it, this is very little with respect to what I wanted to say, but uh, maybe it's a good way for me to stop. Or is it too early? Or? From the face? No, no, I think uh, we should judge from the faces. So maybe okay. we can have a short break now and then we convene at 3 o'clock. Okay. For three, for, are there many smokers? Five plus three. Oh no, three, three, three because three, I have a lot of money. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs>
Sitting like he, he took a table to the field, just slapped his head, and like in nature, like green and the forest all around, and he was just alone there. And, uh, uh, that's cool. that's nice. that's nice. I also used to do the doing bachelor's. That was nice. <laughs> <laughs> no, like you, you really sit in the nature on a table. Yeah, yeah. But the downside is that if you are doing that in the evenings, the mosquitoes are like slamming in your face. You get tired, but not as much as yeah. what I was doing. Ще 
The universities went on, on a strike, except one university, the one where we met each other, and the professors are leaving their positions there because of that. Like permanent professors, yeah, they're like, I quit. Which is pretty interesting. <laughs> Is anybody here? Uh, I don't know my stuff here. Are these yours? Sorry, you can move it. Uh, Scusa, io sono tipo bambino, ho bisogno di Thank you so much for coming back. So before we continue and if you correct something, so here yeah, was D minus one simplex should have at least incident to to D dimensional So here yeah, the edge should be incident to a, at most two triangle, right? And in, in 3D the triangle should be at most incident to two triangle. And this, uh, there was a question here, this is a condition to have a manifold with boundary or without boundary, right? And if you really want a manifold without boundary, you need to impose that any d minus one simplices is exactly incident to two dimensions. Okay? So this will have a boundary, right? If you think of something that doesn't have a boundary at the at the edge, you should be able to find another triangle. Okay. Okay. So let me start now to uh, discuss about algebraic topology uh, and uh, cancel this out um, and we, I start with some notation that will be useful as a reference so, so notation so K, as we said, is the simplicial complex. And then we indicate with Nm the number of M simplices. So N0 will be the number of nodes, N1 the number of edges, N2 the number of triangles, and so on. Q, M, K will be the set of M simplices and here is a little bit heavy notation but I hope you, you allow me to do this so these M simplices we will number them in some order so alpha Rm is the R Art M simplex. Okay. okay. So then you will have the first um, M simplex, the second M simplex. But the order is important or? No, it's just a way to number them. Okay, so let's, let's now start with our uh, direct topology and, uh, and we will start with homology. So um, uh, in homology, important things are M chains. So uh, M 
chain. See, um, in the set of, of the n dimensional chain, uh, consists of the element of a free abelian group with basis on the n synthesis. That means that can be expressed as a linear combination of the synthesis. Okay, so you have the all the, the, the synthesis and you do a linear combination with coefficient in, in the integer, for instance. Okay? Here you sum over all the synthesis in Q. Well, what do you mean by sum in the what does Okay, so you, addition of two synthesis you, means. you consider a simplex as a, 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 an element of a linear space. So, for instance, an example. You have your one, three, two. like that and you might consider this field for instance right and you want to consider a which is a one chain okay and I give you as a which is a one chain I give you one thing minus two thing plus is a linear combination of the synthesis okay? and with coefficient in the z so practically uh, ah sorry I forgot something um, yeah I forgot something I, I will I will add now uh, so practically let me just tell you you go from one to three you go from two to three but with a man with a minus in, in front so you reverse the direction and then you go from two to four so that the representation of this one co-chain is a one chain is this okay here one thing that i miss is actually that uh, in order to define this uh, this linear combination of synthesis, you need to not only consider synthesis but oriented synthesis. Okay? So a syntax, so you need synthesis are synthesis. Are associated to an orientation. So if you have a simplex B0, B1, B2, Bn, this will have an opposite orientation, uh, no, an orientation that is given by this formula. So if you permute the order of the vertices and the permutation is by 0, by 1, by 2, by n, the, the simplex that you obtain as an orientation that is given by the parity of the vertices. <coughs> okay, so, sorry, I, 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 this was something necessary to explain before, maybe. Let me just go back and tell you now this. So, for instance, 
If you have an edge, you have R, S. This has opposite orientation than X. And if you have a triangle, uh, R, S, and Q, you have that the orientation going clockwise, anti-clockwise, anti is the opposite of the orientation of any choice of these vertices going in the uh, clockwise direction. Okay? And all the clockwise choice of these indices has at the same parity and opposite parity to the one that are going uh, in the other direction. So how to choose the positive orientation? This orientation is quite interesting and it's different from direction. So one usual misconception of people that start to look at topologies that are associated to this orientation, the direction. But orientation is different from direction. Okay? So for instance, you can have a flux, something going from, along the edge, right? And you want to give an opposite sign for flux going in one direction and going in the other direction. Okay? And the orientation will tell you which of the two directions will have positive orientation. Okay? So if you, if you have something that goes from R to S, the orientation, if you give a positive orientation from R to S, will tell you that the flux that go from R to S is positive. But if you reverse the orientation, the flux will be negative. Okay? Um, so, so, Sorry, Jennifer, but are you saying it looks like they are the same thing? <coughs> no, it's a convention. Ah, uh, okay, fine, fine. It's a convention. So, you, you go from R to S, mm -hmm. okay, and you need to decide if this is positive or negative. Yes, exactly. Okay? The important is that you can also go in the other direction, mm -hmm. but you associate the opposite sign. To which you associate the plus and to which is associated the minor, this is your orientation. But once you have defined it, then you can interpret it as a flux. If you have a flux, you in that in that direction. Yeah. So an important question is how to define this orientation of the synthesis in general. It might seem like a very difficult task, how to choose that. And in general, there is a way that simplifies and is usually going all all right when you do that. And this is associating an orientation induced by the node labels. So if you have a sequential complex like this, and the labels are arbitrary, right? You, you, you put the label of the node that are arbitrary, and this is a field, field triangle. So the positive orientation will go from 1 to 2, to 2 to 3, from 1 to 3, from 2 to 4, and from 1 to 2 to 3. You associate this as the positive orientation, and a lot of property will be invariant if you change the label of the node. So we will speak tomorrow about Hodge-Laplacian. The spectral property of the Hodge-Laplacian will be independent on the label of the node if you use this orientation. Okay? So in many cases, it's the way to, it's the way to go. In some cases, you really want to design your orientation in a non-trivial way, then you need to. That so might be a silly question, but are all simply complexes uh, orientable? If you want to uh, use algebraic topology, you need to do. Ah, okay, so there is a different meaning of many orientable manifold. Yeah, yeah. Something different than orient about simplicial complexes is a different notion. This is in general for any simplicial complex you can define an orientation, typically induced by the node label, and this proves that you can define it for everything. 
for the, the, the notion of oriented manifold is different. So it's the yeah. same word, but it's a different thing. So we will not do it. Are other question? The definition of the AM chain, the coefficients are restricted to the integers or to the... No, they can be in, in, integer, yeah, better integer, because you... No, you, you can also to take other, 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 other field. Uh, but for us, it's really important. And of course, the AM chains are only defined for M larger or equal to 1. We can add up... You, you can also add zero, you can add... Uh, but then wouldn't it be slightly in conflict with the concept of orientability because how do you orient... Yeah, it? yeah, uh, a, a node is, is, is positively uh, oriented. Yeah, it's, it's kind of zero factorial thing. Yeah. Method of choice. Um, okay, so sorry that I... Permuted a little bit the order, so but these are the M, uh, the, the M chain, so it's a linear combination of synthesis. And now we define one of the most important operators, the axon chain, which is the boundary operator. orientation and then you have D1 S. So you first remove the zero element, so the first one in reality is the zero and the sum is one. The, 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 the coefficient is one. So and what you are left is S. Then you remove the second or B1, remove B1, okay? So the sign is negative and you are left with R. Okay? So from this it comes the boundary because practically every synthesis that is here is at the boundary of, of the M simplex. So here from the edge you go and you have the difference between the two and node of the edge. And, and the sign is important, okay? And if you add a triangle, so R, 
S and Q, you do D2 of R, S and Q. This will be, you remove the zero vertex, S1, and you're left with S2 with the one in front. So you remove that one vertex and you get a minus and you're left with R cube and then you remove the last and you have a plus R S. So here you are going from R to S cube, right? And you are left with something that goes from R to S, from S to Q, and minus R to Q. So you go around the triangle. And that's the boundary of the triangle. Okay. So, so an important property now fundamental property of topology is stated as the boundary of the boundary is new. So you have of the boundary is no. So you go uh, d n plus one d n equal to zero. Okay? So yeah. Here the orientation will of your separation complex will change the uh, output of your boundary like you define your orientation. Yeah, okay. But when you write yeah, but every, everything is it's automatically taken care of. I mean if this has negative orientation, I mean you take this simplex with the typically you take positive. So typically you, you define, when you define and chain as linear combination of synthesis, the synthesis are positively oriented. Uh, so you take a basis in which of course you, you cannot, in a, in a basis of linear combination of synthesis, positive and negative synthesis will, will not be, uh, we are, Will not be independent, so you need only to choose the positive first. Um, what is the interpretation of this boundary of boundaries? Yeah, yeah, we go, we go over this. Yeah. So let me just I, I don't prove this is easily provable with with the definition, but let me just give an example here. So So you want to do this, right? So this we have already done here, right? So we are left with the one of what we have here, which is R S plus S Q minus R Q. Okay? And then you want to use this rule. And then you, you do it, right? So you do uh, last minus first. So S minus R plus Q minus S. And here you have the minus in front. So you do plus R minus Q. See the beauty here, everything simplifies. So S with minus S, Q with minus Q, R with minus R, and this is zero. So because the boundary is what is at the boundary of the triangle. So we have seen that what is at the boundary of this triangle are these three edges with the correct <coughs> orientation. But if you have this one chain, there is no boundary of that because it's closed. 
right? So from from this from this uh, property, it follows that you have some groups, which is the pair of the M. These are all the chain whose boundary is known. And you can show that these are cycle. These are cycle group. So for instance, uh, this thing, right, is a cycle because it goes around and its boundary is known. Um, and then there is another group which is Z M, which is the image of D M plus one. This is also called the boundary group. And the boundary of the boundary group means that any image of D minus one is in the kernel of that time. So the image of delta n plus 1 is included in the kernel. Okay. So in particular, let me modify here a bit. We have our field triangle, and we have seen that when we do the image of the triangle, we have a cycle. But then we can have the unfield triangle, and I can define the one chain which is Rs uh, plus Sq minus R2. I can define this as my one chain A. This will, will, will always be in the kernel of D1. So I will always have D1 equal to zero, but A is not anymore in the image of D2. Right? So it's true that any, uh, um, any chain in an in a image of D2 is in the kernel of the one, but not the opposite, right? So, and in particular, this chain will be around an empty hole, which is something I want to count, right? I would like to count to have the Betty number. Sorry, I have a question. Uh, what are group operations inside this cyclic group and boundary group? Um, group operations addition. addition. You can add <coughs> chain. Okay. So let me just uh, yeah. sorry. But before we said that uh, there is no boundary if any D minus one simplex has two uh, incidents. Right, exactly. Ah, no, it, that, that's another. It's the it's boundary another. of the manifold. Okay. That, that's the boundary of the manifold. Okay. It's another, another thing. thing. Okay. This is the boundary of a field. Okay. Yeah, well, you, you can also do the boundary of the full manifold, but mm -hmm. in, in that. So, e, e, of course, here you have a simplex, you do the boundary of a simplex, but if you have, you have something like this. You can define the, the boundary of a chain that goes around this. The, uh, sorry, the boundary of, a, of the full the boundary of the full simplicial complex will be a chain that goes around everything. Yeah. But in, in, in that description of what is a manifold with the boundary or not, we are only concerned about the boundary of the manifold, so only the, the big boundary. Yet we also want to define the boundary of a given simplex. Um, yes, so let me just because there was this question.
discussion about addition of chain. So this is an important concept that leads to homology group. So the homology groups and M are quotient group between the kernel and the image. Okay? It means that this, uh, this, this, uh, these are homology group. So uh, it follows that A is in the same homology group of A prime if A is equal if A prime is equal to A plus B where B is in the image of so where um, so here uh, and A example I have in my paper which is this one. So you go from two to four, you go around to this empty triangle. So you have two to four minus three to four minus two to three. Two to four minus three to four minus two to three. You go around this. Okay? This is a cycle. Okay, and this, you know, and, and circle this hole, this one dimension hole. But if I have a prime, which is encircled the whole thing, so it goes one, two, plus two, four, minus three, four, minus one, three, this is in circular in always the same hole and is in the same homological class. Indeed, you can prove, and you can. so A is in the same homological class of M prime. In fact, A prime is equal A plus B, where B is one, two, plus two, three, minus one, three, and this is in the image of the two. Is, is this cycle going on? So you can prove at all that, that this, this is true. So these are in the same homological class, and so uh, then what you do is you define the empty numbers, homological class is sufficient to take all the cycle going around this hole with a given coefficient in the integer, you know, 2 and 2a, 
3A, 4A. So the homological group H1 is, is Z. And the betting number is the dimension of the homological group. Uh, so it will be the dimension, that, so, sorry, the, the rank, rank. <clears throat> so it will be the rank of the M minus the rank of the M. This is the way in a direct topology, now you can calculate a T number. So also actually, I think that also in the continuous somehow you discretize and you use this algebraic way. So, in this case, the dimension of uh, uh, the, the rank of Z, you have beta 1, beta 2, 1. Okay, so this, um, this concludes the discussion on homology. Um, before we go to cohomology, I think I want to tell you a little bit about how to construct these boundary matrices on the definition of the boundary operator. So, you have that. boundary matrices. So you recall that you have a definition alternating sum of the synthesis of the boundary. Okay. Uh, so the boundary matrices are the coefficient in front of this task condition. So the boundary BM is a M minus 1 times M, M matrix. Well, so if you have B1, this is the number of nodes times the number of edges. And so let's say we have our simplicial complex 1, 2, 3, and 4. Go here, I run this all. So, you want to construct B1. This is quite easy. So, you put all the nodes as the row and all the edges as the column. Coefficient in front will be the boundary of this edge, right? So the boundary of one two is two. So you put the one here minus one. So you put the minus one and zero zero. So you want to tell me this column? So the boundary of two three is zero. Zero minus one. Minus one. One and zero. One and zero. Perfect. So you fill this table like this, minus 1, 0, 1, and 0, and 0, 0, minus 1, sorry, zero minus 1, 0. Okay? Nothing more easy than that. And if you want to construct B2, you have all the edges. And 
y ayúdate triangle. And here you, you put the boundary of the triangle. So again, you go around the, the triangle. So you have one, two, two, three, minus one, three. And so on, you can define for any boundary matrices in this way. Right? And this, this is all what, what you need numerically if you want to characterize the topology of the special complex. Okay? And of course, here the boundary of the boundary is null. So you have you have uh, this, the boundary of the boundary is null, but if you want, you can also do the same in the transpose operation. So Is for every for every m So these are the property that this boundary operator such. Other question, this is quite important if you want to have end on on the numerical part where you understand the okay. Okay, hopefully we will be able to move to cohomology now. So, yes, is there a simple property that given at the density matrix gives you the, the boundary matrix of the corresponding graph if you, if you assume that all the faces are blank, for instance? There are only two synthesis. Um, the boundary matrix are connected with the Laplacian. Ah, okay, so there is so a. So if you go through the Laplacian, that's. Okay. We, we will discuss tomorrow. Okay. Okay. So let, let me just uh, yeah. So let, let me just completely answer your question. So the graph reflection, which as you know is the diagonal matrix of the degree minus the adjacency matrix, okay, is equal to linear combination of M synthesis. Now we want to define co-chain. M co-chain. So so a M co-chain is a linear function. So, 
to it. Given, given a chain, so a chain, you remember, is a linear combination of the synthesis. So we, we do the sum over the synthesis. with coefficient in, in the integer, okay? And the linear function is specified when we specify the action in each sequence. So the linear function is clearly through linearity, we do the sum over all the synthesis. The coefficient remains the same, but then you have, instead of the simplex, you have the function acting on the simplex. So, practically, a M cochain is defined by a vector, which is the function defined on each positively oriented simplex, okay? So the, the function defined on each simplex allows you to define the function defined on any M chain. So example, so you have a one chain which is 1, 3, times 2, 3, plus 2, 4. You can take the, the example that was there. And then you define f of a to be the function of 1, 3, minus the function of 2, 3, plus the function of 2, so it's enough that you specify the function on the basis. And one important property is that this function is linear. So this is a not function of the simplex, right? So the simplex, you can change the orientation. So since f is linear, I have the function on 1, 3 will be minus the function on minus 1, 3. Or minus the function on 3. Okay? So the function is out. And this is the function that describes the flux. This is the, the flux on, on the links, okay? So you, if, you have, you, if you go from 1 to 3, you define the flux as positive, the flux defined on, and this is minus the flux defined on, on 3, 1. Okay. okay, good. So with this co-chain, I'll actually co Homology is much richer than homology, is much nicer. We will not look at all the operation we can look on with cohomology, but one thing is that uh, cochain, co uh, you can do a scalar product between cochain, and this is quite crucial and is where topology meets geometry. How you do the scalar product? But for today, the scalar product is that to norm. And that probably in, class, in lesson three we will introduce a metric. Okay? So, uh, yeah. okay, so let, let me let, let us define the vector f of element. Fr, which are the function calculated on the R simplex, okay? 
And um, then we, we define the Scala product. between M, M cochain. So we have F and F1 and F2 that are uh, M cochain and we define their scalar product simply as the sum over R of, uh, sorry, let me put this one in top, just to make things more polished, so F1R, F2R, so this is an L2 norm. We are going to modify this in NET, but for topology, when there is no metric, this is the way to go. If you want to introduce intro, Introduce geometry, you need to introduce a metric. Okay. Here we are quite conservative, we, we take that to okay. Um, okay. So we have defined cochain, del to norm. Now we we want to define the equivalent of the boundary operator for cochain, which is of course the co-boundary operator. So the co-boundary operator M goes from M cochain to M plus one cochain and is defined as DMF, so it acts on the N cochain and it generates an N plus one cochain which is the final case. So let me just go element by element, which will be easier to understand. So, so I have this uh, cochain, this is a M plus one cochain, okay? Because this is DM acting on F, so, so F is a M cochain, so DM of F, this will be belonging to M plus one cochain. So I define this on a M plus one simplex, The action of this function, uh, this cochain on, on this m plus one int, will be this operation here, which I write element by element. plus one simplex is uh, alternating sum of the function defined on spaces. And <coughs> from this you can realize that this coefficient are the same but transpose respect to the coefficient of the boundary operator. So if F is a M cochain and G is a M plus one cochain where G is equal delta M F. Then I have that the vector so the function, uh, the function G defined on each simplex is <coughs> described 
by a matrix, co-boundary matrix, and this co-boundary matrix is nothing else, so this is the definition, and the co-boundary matrix is nothing else than the boundary transpose. This is because practically this coefficient in front are just the same as the the, uh, the transpose coefficient with respect to the to the boundary. Okay. So of course you have then delta n plus one delta n equal to zero, and this of course trans traduce into something we have already seen that if I have the concatenation between this boundary operator transpose to this zero. It's the other picture of the boundary of the boundary. And how few minutes more or should I choose? I don't maybe, know what maybe five minutes more or something like that. Okay, so one uh, one uh, important example of the co-boundary operator is the gradient. So gradient. So this is delta zero. So uh, it goes from zero cosine to one cosine. So if f is a zero cosine, so a function defined on the node, g is a one cosine, so the function defined on the edge, and g is delta zero f, then according to that formula, my g on Rs, the function, the the one cochain calculate on the edge is equal to the function f calculate on the second times the function s calculate on the rest. That's the gradient and the curve is which you can also write as B1 transpose F. So 
Delta uh, zero star we go from one cochain to zero cochain and you know if you have um, if you have a, a function and G is uh, one cochain, you have that um, the, the, the and G sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit adding. so you have one cochain and G is a zero cochain and G is the gradient Then you have that the, the vector describing G is in the L1 norm is the, is the boundary of a vector. So the boundary matrix practically can in when you have the L2 norm represent the adjoint of the co-boundary operator. And the uh, when you have the L2 norm, the, the, the boundary matrix transpose will represent the co-boundary. 
So this concludes uh, the lesson today. So the take home would be to uh, you know, understand a little bit about basic concepts about homology and cohomology. And, and the important take home message is that the boundary operators are fundamental, important. They are related to these uh, Betty numbers, as we will discuss also tomorrow. And um, important way is how to construct this boundary operator, you know, in, in, in practice, if you want to realize that. And, uh, and, uh, yeah. and, 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 and that they represent the discrete serial algebra. So you can do gradient, curve, and divergence in this way. Okay? So tomorrow we will do algebra Laplacian, so diffusion using this boundary operator, and the Dirac operator, which is the square root of the Laplacian. You will like it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ginesta. I think we, we reconvene tomorrow then actually at 2 o'clock. So same room, same time. And uh, there might be the occasion that uh, we will share this recording, but I think we will decide later on with Ginestra, uh, maybe, maybe we make it available on the mailing list. I will let you know tomorrow. Okay? So, I'll of course, want some lecture yeah. notes or something like this available. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know if immediately or some time, yeah. Yeah. I, there is my book, which is part of this, but the police doesn't have a Sì, 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 no, è anche lei quella cosa. Ok, anche lei quindi c'è la versione vettoriale. Okay. Poi, um, anche questo è definito a tutti i punti, quello che è questo è su zero semplice. Sì, esatto, che va nel senso c'è la differenza tra F e F, ma è semplicemente sì. più espressione. Sì, sì, sì. Ok, poi, e quando abbiamo detto che eh, la maggior parte delle nostre quantità le dimensioni che volete dal label che do ai miei nodi sì. se utilizzo l'ordinamento l'orientamento indotto dall'ordinamento okay, dall sì, significa che se io uso questo prendo un complesso, un complesso semplice ordinato orientato cambio l'ordinamento ovviamente le frecce rimangono nella stessa direzione sempre no, le frecce cambiano tutte però certe proprietà rimangono invariate ok, esempio, le frecce cambiano tutte che è perfetto sì. Cioè gli ho i singoli singolo value dei bambini operator non cambiano. Ok, perfetto, quindi se io ho un po' di nodi che hanno tipo frecce, cioè posso andare da una situazione in cui, ad esempio, tutti i nodi hanno un link entrante e un link uscente, quindi ah, una situazione in cui tutti i nodi hanno un link entrante e un link uscente, ha una situazione in cui hanno, alcuni hanno più link entranti e zero link uscenti e viceversa? No, no, i link non cambiano, cambia solo l'orientazione. Eh, appunto, cioè entrate e uscente in cui ah, 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 sì, la freccia. Sì, sì, sì. Quindi posso cambiare la quanti, cioè il numero netto di link entrante e uscente facendo questo? Sì, ba basta che non gli sbagliano delle Ok, sì. dopo provo un po' di esempi allora. Sì, sì, sì. Eh, ci sarà, per esempio, se c'è un triangolo, un gli sbagliano label vuol dire che c'è sempre diciamo, un link più strato, no? Perché c'è sempre... Se ho solo un... Non puoi andare intorno al triangolo, con le orientazioni. Perché avrei 1, 2, 3... Quindi la cosa sarebbe 1, 2, 2, 3 e poi 1, 3, ok, sì. perfetto. Quindi hai delle constraints in di spider node label, non puoi fare tutto. Ok, ah, ok, perfetto. Okay, quindi... Però sì, puoi cambiare, per, perché per esempio se c'hai il triangolo, c'hai il nodo 1, che ha tutti e due uscenti, lo puoi cambiare, puoi definire che uno è un altro nodo. Però nel senso uno rimarrà con tutti e due uscenti. Sì, però è un altro nodo. Sì, 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 ok. Eh... 
Allora, sì, ecco, quando abbiamo finito la questione di manifold o non manifold, sì. eh, Marcello ha chiesto del fatto di la relazione tra la prima e la seconda eh, regola di risposta sì. è stata quindi che se io, eh, eh, se io ho pinching posso comunque avere di meno una connection, sì. ma ci sono casi in cui posso avere, in cui ho nessun pinching ma non ho di meno una connection che non, che non implichi non avere proprio, cioè non sì. avere connection. Sì, sì, sempre. Uh, ah, che non implica... Perché sì, cioè, sì. no, se tu hai questo non hai, non hai uno di meno uno connection, però non hai anche pinching. Non ho di meno uno connection? Perché non ho pinching in questo caso? Beh, perché in realtà il pinching... Il pinching vuol dire che... Eh, Ah no, anche lì, eh, cioè tu hai che le T-1 facce, no, le T-1 facce hanno un'intenzione che è se o nulla o P. Quindi ho P in questo caso. Sì, qui hai. No, non ha P in no. No, no, non sono capito. Questo si, questo si implesso e questo si implesso, se l'intersecco è sotto un nuovo. Che quindi passa da, da cioè l'intersezione di due, due dimensioni. Sì, però credo che quella condizione, se non mi ricordo bene, era solo sulle team. Ah no, no, era. Non lo so. Non lo so. Ora mi ricordo. Ora mi ricordo. Ora mi ricordo. L'importante è che devi, non devi avere questo. Cioè, questo comunque non è un manifold. Ma questo è considerato un pinch? Non lo so, okay. non lo so. Però non è un manifold. Non è un manifold. Sì, sì. Ok. Grazie. Scusi, le posso chiedere? Eh, per piacere, sono Giulia. Ah, eh, eh. Lei ha, ha, ha tempo 5 minuti? Sì. No? Ha mai lavorato con omologia della magnitudo? Che è una teoria omologica per grafi. Ah, no. eh, ah ok. Eh. No, eh, no, niente, vabbè, le volevo chiedere. Io adesso sto, sto facendo il dottorato, sto lavorando con questa omologia e stavo eh. cercando di capire che informazioni dava del grafo se poteva essere utile da usare ah, per un'analisi di, di reti. Eh. Vabbè, allora magari se si ferma due settimane sì, a tempo... possiamo sì. parlarne. Sì, 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 grazie. Sì, sì, allora magari le mando una... Tu dove sei? Dove lavori? All'università qui. Ah, ah, sì, sì, sì. Ah. Eh, sì, 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 va bene. Grazie. <ride> sì, va bene, se vieni domani comunque. No, sì, sì, sì. Ok, ok, va bene, grazie. <ride> non so se era troppo molto denario. No, ma okay. che lo fa per i video di così. Sì, sì, no, vabbè, ma non c'è niente. Ok, sì, super chiaro. Ah, sì, sì, sì. <ride> grazie. <ride> Ciao, arrivederci.
Life is boring. Okay, how is this problem? What is about? I think it means now my plan is not to try to. I will try this, I will try this. You can take forget, it. Forget about homework 78. But according to the two you were saying, I think I, I have to complete them. You have to complete It's a nice idea. I will complete them. If I complete it through our them, I think it's, just, it's much better. Yeah. If I complete all them, if, I if you get, uh, got the last marks in a final. I can't forget so. about it. No, I don't want, I, I will need to, I want to forget about the, the midterm. Yes, your midterm is not okay. It's not okay. Okay, first of all, how do you solve this problem? I think you solve it, I don't know. If I have with convergence, I have with convergence. Mm -hmm. okay. so I have with convergence. I have a stop on 